Welcome to our very first episode of Leaders in Cars. In the coming episodes, we will get the world's most maverick leaders, put them in extremely cool cars and talk to them about their very personal leadership experience. Our host, Heiko Fischer, is the founder of Resourceful Humans, the company that turns organizations into entrepreneurial networks. Today's guest is David Marquet, retired Navy captain of the nuclear submarine Santa Fe. David ended up on the Santa Fe without knowing enough about this specific type of submarine. He had no choice but to let go of control and lead his team by intent, turning the submarine into a network of captains where everybody leads. Today, David is one of the world's most favorite speakers on leadership and author of the book, Turn the Ship Around. Heiko and David will share their ideas on leadership and HR in the 21st century. Since every car is hand-picked to complement the character of our guest, we picked the Tesla Model S for our guest, David. So why is this the perfect car for our guest today? From the outside, the Santa Fe looked like any other submarine. Inside, the leader-leader model of autonomous teams was anything but normal. The Tesla also looks like a normal car, but it has a revolutionary new way of getting from A to B. Have fun watching our first episode of Leaders in Cars. Hey man, what's up? Yeah, 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 I'll come over. We'll get some coffee, yeah. Yeah, be right over. Alright, see you in like 10 hours. Bye. How does this thing run? Fast. Ah! <laughs> How fast does that thing actually go? Like a submarine at top speed? What is, what does it go? I can't tell you. It's a secret. Is it? Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. They are real secrets. <laughs> they are real secrets. Okay. We can go. Um... Because you think it's kind of a lumbering, huge thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 huge, but it's not lumbering. Okay. Okay, so I'm now imagining like a dart through water or something like that. Yeah. But can, like, is that is it classified to ask? Is it faster underwater or sort of like a no, ship? No. It, yeah, it's much faster underwater. It's, okay. Everything is designed to be underwater. Think about it. Like when you when you look at that technology now, yeah. back then, yeah. how far it has come in a relatively short span of time. Very short. That's amazing, though. And you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I don't know if you saw that. There, there was a question that came up, which was, um, "Do you think we're going to have one million autonomous cars before we will have one million autonomous teams and companies, like <laughs> you know, intent-based teams?" Because mm. uh, do I don't have the feeling that we're making as much progress, like in terms of how we interact with each other, as we are in technology. That's baffling to me. Yeah. Well, I think. It's it's easier to change an algorithm than it is to change a habit, and we have these sort of habits and these built-in habits, and uh, we're just stuck on them. This is interesting. So, like, honestly, what do you think? What, what was like? Was there a prerequisite for yourself to change an algorithm about yourself before you felt that you could apply this to others? You know, for me, I was just I was just scared shitless. When so I was that's a good motivator. Yeah, well, death. Yeah, we say death is a good motivator. I'm so I'm standing there on the submarine, and my guys do this order that they, you know, they repeat the order that I that can't be done, and I'm just saying like, oh my god, we're gonna die, we're gonna die, we're gonna die, <laughs> because they're gonna eventually, you know, I'm just gonna keep giving orders and they're gonna keep doing them, and eventually I'm gonna screw it up and it's gonna have to be bad, and yeah, it scared the crap out of me. You know, in in a way. I think that's that's why there was an immediate resonance for me when I heard your story because for me it was terrifying when I was the, the head of HR at Crytek that I was irrelevant. People didn't give a <laughs> shit about HR. You know, they were just like, you're really in our way. No, no, they, they, cared. they actually hated you. Absolutely. Yeah, hated As a HR. person too. <laughs> yeah. They looked at me, it took no, one good thing. look at me and yeah, they were like, like HR? we're going to manage you out and yeah. HR is going to be our excuse for it. Right. Which, you know, 
thinking about it now, we should just stop the car and get out. No one loves this conversation. Yeah, no one loves HR. No one loves HR. Well, you were lucky. You didn't have HR in the submarine. But, you know, I think HR is very important. I think HR writes the DNA for the culture of the organization. Like, we think the CEO... You know, caveat, I would say they should. No, they do. Whether they want to or not. Oh, okay. If well, they can write bad yeah. DNA, they can, it should comes up in a Frankenstein, or or you can write good DNA. All right. Okay. And um, because the CEO says this, but then HR encodes it this way. And so I've been to organizations where the CEO is saying, oh, hey, yeah, well, this is a very inclusive organization, but then deep inside some HR rule, you can't you know, people in the company, you can only send an email to certain it people. It actually goes counter to that, Yeah, right? and then not only is it, so you might as well, so the hypocrisy is worse than just not saying anything. This car can do it all by itself. What? Look at that. No hands. I'm a little uncomfortable right now. Yeah, we can do the Hollywood thing, you know? Like in Hollywood, when you see that they're actually not, yeah, that not bo- in a real car. Does that bother you, though? It needs to bother you. I was like, hold on. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to this. <laughs> I have to tell wow, you. Wow, that is crazy, man. Are you the, guys getting this? You see what's happening here? <laughs> but the one guy I really want to get into is... There's a car coming up. We're coming up on a car. Don't you have to do something? Look at it. You can sense it. You know all about sonar. Look at this. It's, it's going to do it all by itself. It's confidence inspiring because you can see what the car sees. That's a, that, you know, that's a cool point. Because it's not saying, like, just trust me, period. It's saying, hey, here's what I see. And it's building trust. This is the perfect segue for us to go into HR again. Now stress caused my my brain to paralyze. That was the situation I was in. It was really, it was that situation where I thought, you know, you were in a much more commanding position. I was in a position, I was basically down in engineering and people didn't call me. Right. They were like, that, that part of the ship is irrelevant. Right. <laughs> we don't need it. How'd that feel? Horrible. Felt shitty. Yeah. Really? So I was the guy you were talking about when you said people are frustrated. I was the HR guy and said, I'm frustrated. Yeah. Because I think there's nothing worse than being irrelevant to others. Invisible. Yeah. That's, so That sucks. And, and I think this, so this, you know. How does that feel? <laughs> it's just so much better <laughs> since I made a business out of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, but, you know, we always get shit for saying that, you know, kill HR. But in the end, that was just a way for us. You know, it's like a, like in a suicide thing. People want attention, right? Yeah. So for us, it was this way of saying, imagine we were not here. What would happen? And people were like, we'd be fine with that. So we were like, all right, well, then how about we plan for not being here? And I think that's where I really connected to your story to say, but now to crack the algorithm of not doing that in a, fuck you kind of way but in a constructive way to hey wouldn't that actually be awesome if we didn't need HR or what this classic HR stands for or wouldn't it be great if we could run organizations without this leader who has to always command people around and be the smartest guy yeah so HR I'm gonna tell you something interesting on the submarine we all have our standard jobs like the engineer is the engineer but we have what we call collateral duties so these are additional little jobs that people have and the captain only has one collateral duty okay and he's the morale he or she is the morale officer okay so when i look at these um ceos and they want to outsource the culture or the morale of their people to hr that's just not going to work yeah like the the head of hr is one of the most important people in the organization and they need to be synced up with the CEO. But the CEO can't say, oh, you have good relationships with my people. I'm too busy. Oh, you make my people feel good. I'm too busy. Like, that doesn't work. You can't outsource those good feelings. Okay, here's my first question to that. You, you've, you've now been out there in the you know, organizational world. You've met a lot of HR people. How many really good HR people have you met? And I, you know, remember, I'm I'm third generation HR. This is my yeah. thing. So you can talk straight with me. I'm, you know, it's uh, it's hard for me to say because I don't. We don't spend a lot of time together. Um, I I think it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. I think so. We sort of treat HR badly, and you kind of get what you get. So the problem with HR is it's not HR. The problem with HR is is it's we we 
collapse it into just like just write some policies. It's control, right? Uh, here's the vacation policy. Here's the uh, equal opportunity policy, and and it's a combination of the lawyers want to protect the organization and over controlling people who treat people like you know four year olds. I think, but I think that's a cop out. I think you know that if we treat HR as if they are they can't because they're not enabled to to be that core DNA of the company. I, I wish we had more ballsy HR guys who would just say, fuck it, I'm just going to take the lead here. I'm, it, sometimes <laughs> their department is as sizable as your crew was on a submarine, right? There's at least 100 plus people in HR. Right. So why not start in your own organization, say, I'm going to set a different tone here. Forget about the rest of the organization for a while. I don't understand why that is not happening more. Like all all the innovation, no matter what we think about it, be it an agile, a holacracy, it doesn't come out of HR, it comes out of IT or somewhere else. Right. It's, I find it's deeply frustrating. Leadership means taking care of the people around you. Leadership doesn't mean taking care of myself. You know, accomplishment, that's a, we have a word for that, it's called accomplishment. You got something done, great. Here, let me clap for you, right? That's not leadership. We have a different word. So for me, we kind of have this definition of leadership wrong. We got to rethink it. It's not about what you do. It's about what your team does. And that is totally what our internal systems and processes are totally not geared for. That's correct. So that's why people ask this question, are leaders uh, made or born? Yeah. Leaders are not only not made, we're anti-made. Yeah. Because the idea of giving control, um, the idea of saying, it's your call. You make a decision. The idea of taking your hands off the wheel and saying... I'll give you that cue. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, Just for you. Yeah, I'm taking my that. hands off yeah, the wheel. Uh, We're practicing intent-based driving. I'm going to take a picture of that with my phone. My wife's going to yell at me when she sees the hat. But I, you let him do that? You let him, I let Elon do that. We wanted to have Elon in the car. Elon yeah. is with us right now. So, um, that... Uh, that, those are, you're, you're wired not to do that. So those will, it will feel scary. It will feel scary. Um, here's something you can do. Go to dinner, but don't order. Say, hey, waiter, you pick for me. Like, that's scary. That scares a lot of Especially people. Especially when you have a nut allergy. Well, yeah, if you're going to touch a peanut and die, you might want to say something. <laughs> <laughs> no peanuts. But, but that's scary. So, so... For me, you're almost acting counter to what your, your impulses are telling you to do. Sometimes it's right to trust your impulses, but for some of these things, you got to act in the face of your impulses. And the cool thing is, though, you can practice what that feels like. And then when you go to work, that's the feeling you should have. If you feel it's very comfortable, it feels very sort of safe, I'm not psychologically vulnerable, then you're not... You know, you're not, you're not, you're not stretching. You're not building a team. And I think that's what what's interesting because so what would you say is the primary purpose of leadership as it's defined now in organization? Well, I don't know how it's. Def I'll tell you how, what I think it should be. Leadership is about creating an environment where your people can be at their best. Not we order you to be at your best, but just simply as a result of being in this environment, I'm my best person. I'm in an environment where people. Uh, where it feels safe to take a little bit of risk, where it feels safe to say, you know what, here's what I think. Like, hey, yeah, let's try this, right? And we don't get critical. Well, that's a half-baked idea, you know, all that kind of stuff. Because only in those environments will the creativity come out. Because when we put people under stress, it's like this thing earlier, it, it scares me. And, and my brain shuts off. And it only becomes about me preserving my own, like, uh, I've just got to protect myself. Could you point to one source where you say that was one thing that really gave you the confidence of saying, I've seen that in that leader? Yeah. So when I was uh, on my very first submarine, uh, the first captain I had was sort of a very traditional, very, you know, do exactly what you're told. Then I got a new guy. And I'm, I'm uh, standing watch as the officer of the deck. So I, we're driving, I'm driving the submarine. We're doing training off of the coast of the United States. I want to activate the sonar which 
you couldn't do without the captain's permission because it sends a big ping out into the ocean. We don't normally do it, but it's a good thing to practice every once in a while. And we were off the coast of the United Basically States. Basically, it makes you visible to everybody. Yeah, right? but it also it's a way for us to, to know if there's see, a big see, cliff coming. Yeah, see sometimes that you might not, not be able to see. So I'm sort of just musing. I'm saying, hey, why don't we go active on sonar? And all of a sudden, the captain like appears next to me. And he says, well, why don't you? And I'm looking at him like, well, you know the reason. It's because I need your permission. And he says, just say, just do this. Just say, Captain, I intend to go active on sonar. Here's why. Here's why I want to do it. Here's why it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. And so I said that. Now, I'd never, like, seen this before. And so I said that. And he said, very well. And he walked away. And that, like, unleashed this, like, passion and, and, and creativity and energy in me. And this brings us to our coffee place. Nice. Let's get some coffee. Let's get some coffee. And you know what my gesture always is when I get coffee here? Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> the IV drip thing. And the funny thing is... You got the Ash, Ashbury Hay shirt on. The, 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 awesome, the awesome thing about this is that I come in in the mornings regularly here, and they look at me and I go, I need an espresso. And he, go, he looks at me and he goes, a double. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have to say anything anymore. They will just be like... So you're having an espresso. That's right. So here's a... You know the, um, the book I showed you yesterday, the one that was sent to me by um, yeah. a former business partner, now friend, this guy is called um, Kelly, Kelly Max. Um, and we were talking about what motivates us to do what we do or what drives us, right? And we were talking about non-toxic work environments and what an effect that can have on a family environment. The worst thing you can do for your life is to put up with bad leadership because it's going to take a toll on your health and and you're you're <laughs> killing yourself and, and our, this bad leadership we're killing people so the question is people say well how do I know when it's time to quit how do I know how bad it should be and I say well imagine it's your daughter or your son in this situation and you knew what they were putting up with, what would you advise them to do? Oh, well, I would tell them to quit. I'd tell them not to put up with that. But like, well, why are you putting up with it? Well, remember we had this discussion about you can change the submarine, but it's really hard to change the Navy because the people who will oppose you are likely the ones who have been furthest away from the submarine or the action. They're just political animals and you, you threaten the status quo, right? The, 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 your new source code <laughs> threatens their code. Right, yeah, so you ignore them. Like today, you go on any submarine, you'll hear them say, "I intend to." It's spread. No one, oh, no one, said do it. It's so just, you would even say, "Don't even fight it. Just do it." No, you ignore. The principle is to invest all your energy in the people who are moving forward with you, the people who who you are attracted to and are attracted to you, and you ignore. So ignoring people doesn't mean, "Hey, I'm going to ignore you." It just it actually means ignoring them. So you mean like the Robert Downey Jr. thing? Listen, smile, agree, and then do whatever the fuck you want to do anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. Why don't we start at the bases where kids actually learn to think different from the start, right? And we had this fantastic experience, the two of us, haphazardly, when we picked up my daughter from school and she was talking about the, the biology teacher who says, I don't know is not an acceptable answer yeah. from a student, right? <laughs> And you were like, oh, God, you yeah. know, but now you're actually putting on something for teachers. Right? Yeah. So I'm really excited about this. We uh, we have a lot of educators. So, so the idea is you want to let the person closest who has the most information and closest to the, the customer, closest to the code. In my, in my daughter's the case, the problem yeah, is okay. The problem. You want, you want them to make the decision. Right. So the idea is let, like, let's let the teachers make the decisions about the, the kids. Or to push the authority to the information. So we've got a number of educators who are trying this, and we're just bringing them together, and uh, we're calling it the Educators Leadership Conference, and we're just putting people on stage to tell stories about how they're trying this, what's working, what's not working, what the trouble spots are, uh, whether are there legal issues, uh, does the union like it, do they not like it, you know, how, how... So basically you're looking, how can you rewire the algorithm or hack the framework? Right. Have you watched Groundhog Day, Bill Murray? Yeah, of course, man. You know how he keeps the recurring day, but yeah. the, he keeps altering the day? Right. Depending on what he does? Yeah. 
And I, isn't that a little bit what we do as a leader, that at, at some point we walk into a routine environment and with the nuances of how we behave differently, we can shape the day differently. Right. And yeah, we, totally. And, you know, at the end of the day, you can only control yourself, right? You, any attempt to say, okay, you be, the, you be more proactive, you be take initiative, you speak up if you don't like what I'm saying, it's all just manipulation. It just kind of feels icky. So we have to figure out, like, what can I do so that I create an environment where you just, you're naturally proactive. Like, if I'm leaning into you and say, oh, do this, it's just not going to work. And I say, well, well hey, what do, you, what do you think? You know, what would you do? <laughs> you're <laughs> like, you're like, invading my space. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> that, too. But we, we're doping we're cyclists. We're submariners, so we're a little... Oh, you have to rub shoulders. Yeah, no, we're pretty, you know, we're close. <laughs> it's a close-knit group. Hey, we shared a bathroom. We should be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I handed you a towel. We should be fine. Yeah, it was good. It was through, yeah, but through the door. I, I closed my eyes. Yeah. I, didn't, so <laughs> I respected your privacy. <laughs> So I think, if you think about Groundhog Day, right? For me, there were three stages. There was Bill Murray being an authentic dick, and that's how the day shaped out. Then he was trying to be a fake hero, right? And he tried to get the girl into bed, basically, with his best behavior. And then he actually tried self-discovery, in a way, right? And being authentic, better him. Right. I think getting from that stage to that stage is very often really difficult because the leaders that we work with in organizations try to find or adapt to a new hero model, right? The new source code, rather right. than to say, what does that mean for you, right? You're, you're not David Marquette, you're not Heiko Fisher, you're not Tony Shea, you are who you are. And what does that mean for you to, to apply these principles or intent-based leadership and to become the best version that you can be? Right. Which is super hard for people to not say, tell me what that is again, you know? Can I just copy David until I figure it out? Right. And people will be like, you're probably not going to get your crew in bed like that. You know, that's not yeah. symbolically speaking. That right? was one of my worries is um, people would just take, oh, I'm just going to do mechanisms 1 through 28. You know, we'll just do the exact same thing in our organization, which it's ironic. When <laughs> the whole thing is about not telling people what to do. But when the client says, oh, tell me what's to do. It's like the Monty Python thing, <laughs> right? Like, Where they're going, you, we're all find, individuals. Do you find that as funny I as I find <laughs> As we pretty, pretty much emptied our stuff, how about we enjoy the sun a little more and go for a little yeah, walk before nice. you got to head out and bring some coffee back to Jane. Yeah, I got, yeah that would be a mistake. Now okay. that you sufficiently Biblical motivated me. <laughs> Don't. Happy wife, happy life. There you go. Don't piss off the wife. All right, All right let's do it. This was our first episode of Leaders in Cars. Stay tuned for our second episode. Thank you for watching and sharing our show.